New Black Wall Street Book Club. Hey, Grand Rising to your billionaires. Thanks so much for joining us here today on a New Black Wall Street Book Club where black folk do read. You put in a book, we absolutely will find it. I'm your host, ERGJ, your certified financial educator and CEO of ERGJ Enterprises, ERGJ Black Bazaar, and international best selling author of the book, The Black Billionaires Club. That book there is a study of black wealth. That book there is a study of the 12 richest black people in the world today. And how they built their wealth. And I just truly believe that if you want to be wealthy, that's a big if, by the way. But if you do, I recommend that you study wealthy people. Oh, man, I should have tested this thing before that thing went because it always kind of goes slow in the beginning. But at any rate, some video going to pop up in just a second whenever it decides to move. Until that time, you guys can check out the website by picking up the book by going to the website, theblackbillionersclub.com. That's right, theblackbillionersclub.com. <laughs> It always does this. <laughs> All right, my beautiful people, you pick up your hard copy or also ebook. It's available in French and also French audiobook. At theblackbillionersclub.com. That's right, theblackbillionersclub.com. Pick up your copy today. I will tell you this: it's a very exclusive book. Uh, I don't know how many more copies we'll actually uh, create because I want to make sure that those who actually have a copy has something that is worth that is very very valuable as time goes on. So it will be limited copies that will be printed. It will not. I do not plan to sell it on Amazon. If you got the book, you got the book. If you don't. Oh, well, that's just kind of how it's going to go. But you want to make sure you pick up your copy by going to the website, theblackbeardnessclub.com, theblackbeardnessclub.com. Well, guys, I want to say thanks so much for joining us here today, man. Go ahead and hit the like button, the share button if you care. Let people know that we're here and we're black folk and we're reading. Also, let us know where you're connecting from, what city, what state, what country, or quite possibly what city, what state, what country. We're broadcasting across the world wide web, and we understand that we can be meeting, we can be reaching people all over the world. We'd like to know where you are connected from. Broadcasting here from Decatur, Georgia. That's right, Decatur, where it's greater. And love to know where you're connected from here on the New Black Wall Street Book Club. Good morning to you, Miss Vivian Reed, Facebook. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning to you, Miss Sincere Newman. Thanks so much for joining us. Brooklyn is representing Vivian Reed over YouTube as well. Thanks so much for joining us. Straight out of Chirac, man. Good morning to your brother out of Chicago. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Vivian Reed said you got three copies. You got to make sure you got that thing. Thanks so much for joining us as well. And wherever you might be joining us from, joining with us here today on New Black Wall Street Book Club, let's, 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 let's get it. Uh, today's show is being sponsored. We've got two sponsors today. First sponsor is ERGJ Black Bazaar, the Afrocentric Marketplace. That's right. I sponsor my own ish. That's right. ERGJ Black Bazaar, um, the uh, Afrocentric Marketplace, where we specialize in Afrocentric home decor, natural personal care products, and also black art inspired gifts. When you go to the website, man, you can actually find the shirt that I have on by simply going to the apparel section. And there you will see right black folk uh do read t-shirt here that you pick up today by simply uh finding us here on the website check us out at www.ergjblackbazaar.com that's right www.ergjblackbazaar.com and i want you guys to remember this that once you shop black you never go back that's right once you shop black you never go back taste and see that black is good <laughs> taste and see that black is good also our other sponsor here today is big sis media group Everything that you see that I do here, guys, is actually created by Big Sis Media. So our websites, our digital uh, flyers, everything that you see that pretty much comes from the ERGJ brand is powered by Big Sis Media. So you can check them out by simply going to the website, BigSisMediaGroup.com. They are a full-service creative design agency. Everybody put in the comments below to create a creative design uh, agency um, with the tools available to help clients communicate with audiences through visual and digital media. They are there to watch over your most critical cre creative needs like a big sis would. That's right. Big sis media group who powers ERGJ and my brand. I'm letting you guys know you get some dope stuff from big sis by simply going to the website, www.bigsismediagroup.com, www.bigsismediagroup.com. Thank you so much, big sis. That's right. Thank you so much, Big Sis. One quick announcement, guys. We'll get right into the show here today. I do have a goal. That goal is 1,000 YouTube subscribers. 
So if you're not on YouTube yet, or if you haven't quite gone there yet, here's something that you can do for free to help ERGJ out. Now, why do I want to do this? Well, once I get to the 1,000 subscriber, then I can start to monetize my videos, and then YouTube can pay me so you don't have to. So you can simply go to YouTube, click the subscribe button, and then that's it. It's free for you to do. I don't know why you wouldn't do something that's free, but I know that you will because the good Lord said to me, he said, ask and you shall receive. And we're currently at about 676 uh, subscribers. We've got 300, 200, 224 more to go to reach our 324 more to go. 324 more to go to reach our goal by the end of the year. And you can help by simply going to YouTube, ERGJ Enterprises, and hitting the subscribe button. That's right, man. Well, it's time for us to get this show started with our daily motivation for African-American success. Good morning to you, Mr. Consistent up in the house, man. Good morning to you, Mr. James Brooke Moore. Good morning to you. Thanks so much for joining us with our daily motivation for African-American success by Mr. Dennis P. Kimbrough. Daily motivation for African-American success by Mr. Dennis P. Kimbrough. Now, I will say this. This is one of the great black authors of our time. As a matter of fact, tonight we're actually having a special presentation, which will which be the, will be the return of the Black Author Speaker Forum. So that's going to be tonight at eight PM. Again, the black the return of the Black Author Speaker Forum. So you can find other black authors and or speakers who do dope stuff that you can uh, you can support because we've been supporting a lot of others. Why not support our own? And that's what we can do. But at any rate. Daily Motivation for African American Success by Mr. Dennis P. Kimbrough. Whenever you see that name, Dennis P. Kimbrough, on a book, make sure you buy it. That's just how it goes because you go, that they got some pretty cool stuff up in there you'll find out here today. Our title for today is Let's Cut to the Chase. Everybody put that in the comments below, Cut to the Chase. How many guys want people in your life who just simply get to the chase instead of doing all this running around and, and talking around stuff and doing all this extra stuff? You're like, can we just get to the point? Well, that's right, man. Let's cut to the chase. And here is our quote of the day. And this quote comes from Marcus Garvey. The Pan-Africanist Mr. Marcus Garvey says this, and I quote, do what is required of you and remain a slave. Do more than is required and become free. Oh, Lord, Mr. Marcus Garvey. What a profound quote this is. Let's read this again. Mr. Marcus Garvey says this. Do what is required of you and remain a slave. Do more than is required and become free. Everybody put in the comments below, do more. Do more and become free. Wow. Well, let's find out what Mr. Dennis P. Kimbrough is talking about here today as we get our motivation through our passage of the day. Let's read. A comedian once quipped, uh, many of us are at the metallic age, gold in our teeth, silver in our hair, and lead in our pants. How everybody wants to live a long time, but nobody wants to get old. People who are bored or unhappy can live happy, uh, productive lives, regardless of age, if they take the trouble to find what, is, what it is they really want. If they can settle upon a purpose, they can be filled with new vitality. It will seem as though they found the fountain of youth, a way to turn back the clock and experience a life filled with interest, excitement, and fulfillment. There's an old fable about a dog that boasted of his ability to run at, at breakneck speed. One day he chased a rabbit and failed to catch it. The other dogs ridiculed him on account of his previous bravado. He replied, you must remember that the rabbit was running for his life while I was only running for my dinner. You see, the purpose is so important. The purpose is so important. I've met many people who found excitement in youth throughout their lives. I remember my interview with A.G. Gaston, the 100-year-old insurance tycoon from Birmingham, Alabama. People like Dr. Gaston never age. Their minds and interests remain as young and clear at 100 as they were at 20 because they had a singular purpose in life. They have a high degree of empathy with others. They eat and sleep well. They work, play, and love with gusto. Men and women with settled objectives, people who know who they are and where they are going, achieve their goals. There's no stopping them. They're filled with energy, drive, and 
with too much desire to slow them down. Are you one of these people? You can be. That's a great question to ask this morning. Are you one of these people? A person who has a high degree of empathy for others. A person who eats well and sleeps well. A person who works and plays in love with gusto. A, a person with a settled objective. Now, this is so important, beautiful people, because too many of us do not have an objective. We get up and we move around, same thing, different day, without having an objective in life. And matter of fact, so much so that we teach our children the very same thing. Just live with no objective and I guess everything will work itself out. Well, what is it like to actually get up every day on purpose? Or knowing that today is another day for me to go after my objective, to fulfill my destiny, or to finish my mission? Are you that person who's filled with energy and drive and too much desire to slow you down? These type of people are very few. I only meet a few of these type of people. The question is, are you one of them? Are you one of them? Let's cut to the chase. Now, here's our affirmation of the day. Here's what you want to allow to take root into your subconscious, your heart. And then you can grow and develop this thing by repeating it over and over and over again until it brings forth a harvest in your life. We understand that the power of life and death is in the tongue. So we're going to use our power this morning to speak life into our life. Repeat after me. Today. I will take a few moments to redefine my goals. It's better that I wear out than rust out. What a powerful affirmation. Let's do it again. Our affirmation of the day, repeat after me. Today. I will take a few moments to redefine my goals. It's better that I wear out than rust out. Man, think about that. A key word there, redefine. Now, some of us, only a few of us, but some of us have actually made goals for this year, 2019. And even though it might be December 5th today as we're recording this, it might be time to redefine those goals so you can move forward. Maybe some of these things you've accomplished, you haven't set new goals. I'm not quite sure. But, but success is the progressive realization of worthy goals. Do you have worthy goals? And are you making progress towards those goals? If so, you're a success because you know what you want and you are going towards that which it is that you want. Not what everybody else wants for you, but what you want for you. Why? Because it's your life. Our affirmation of the day, let's do it one more time for the people in the back, the people in the way back. This time, we want to make sure that they hear us and they know we mean business. This time, say it with some conviction. Repeat after me. Today, I will take a few moments to redefine my goals. It is better that I wear out than I rust out. Look at that dynamic. Between wearing out, meaning that you put pedal to the middle. Metal, you went all out. You went after that thing, and you simply were exhausted at the end of your day. First, you did absolutely nothing. And you began to grow mold and old and rusted away because you didn't use what you got. You rusted out. Which one are you going to be? The person that wears out 
You gave it your all. You exhausted your day. Or the person that work that rust out, you did absolutely nothing, and then you grow grow old as well as you grow mold. Isn't there something about stagnant water that it can be very drinkable if it's moving, but if it sits there all day long, it becomes undrinkable because it grows mold. You and I are ninety five percent water. You and I, if we are moving, we keep vitality. If we're moving. We keep fresh, but if we are stagnant, we grow old and we grow mold. Will you wear out or will you rust out? Let's cut to the chase. Daily Motivations for African American Success by Mr. Dennis P. Kimbrough. Daily Motivations for African American Success by Mr. Dennis P. Kimbrough. Oh, uh, well, my beautiful people, that is our appetizer, our affirmation. Get us to get us, let's get it started. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> to get us started this morning, man. Hey, our meter today is actually going to continue along in the book Black Fortunes, which is the story of the first six African-Americans to escape slavery and become millionaires. We are now into chapter 14 here on New Black Wall Street Book Club, and we will complete this book by the end of the year. We got about five more, six more chapters, four more chapters to go, 15, 16, 17, 18. So, so basically three more weeks will be done, and we'll be done by the end of the year. And so we're into chapter 14, which is the most powerful black man alive. The most powerful black man alive. Now, we're going to be talking about or continue on talking about Robert Reed Church, who, if you remember from previous episodes, which you can catch on our New Black Wall Street Book Club podcast, in case you've missed anything, um, Robert Reed Church is in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, he's a part of this thing called Bill Street. You might have heard of that, that, uh, that movie. Uh, he has built an empire in Memphis, and he ain't going nowhere. He done had about three or four life death, near death experiences, and he's still kicking as we are into chapter 14. Y'all know what time it is. Black folk, let's read. <laughs> chapter 14, the most powerful black man alive, part one. At the turn of the century, so now we're talking about 1900. Everybody put in the comments on 1900. I think it's important for us to understand the time in which we're talking about 120 years ago. At the turn of the century, a Robert Reed Church was 60 years old. He now walked with a cane. His eyes were still fiery and bloodshot, and he remained fearless and quick-tempered. A decade earlier, in 1889, he had begun to draw up plans for a park and an arena for black citizens in Memphis. This brother was about to make a park and an arena in Memphis in early 1900s. Uh, do you hear what I'm saying? This brother had plans to build a park and to build an arena for black folk in the late 1800s in Memphis, Tennessee. Do y'all understand the significance of what we're talking about here? Let me say this one more time for the people in the back, because I don't think y'all heard me. This black man in the late 1800s would have plans. Everybody put in the comments on plan. He had plans to build a park and to build an arena like the Georgia Dome for black folk in Memphis, Tennessee in the late 1800s. Okay? <laughs> okay? Do y'all understand that? Let's keep going. As their, as their construction near completion, he wondered how white Memphis would react to his project. His life has been filled with attacks by Confederates, uh, racist police officers, still going on today, and segregationists who for daring to strive as a black person. Let me read that again. He wondered how white Memphis would react to his project. His life had been filled with attacks by Confederates. His life, this black man, was filled with racist 
police officers. His life had been filled with segregationists for daring to strive as a black person. And I dare you this morning on the new Black Wall Street Book Club, I dare you to strive as a black person. I double dare you. I triple dog dare you to strive as a black person. Now, here's the deal. If he dealt with this back in the late 1800s, if you dare to strive as a black person, don't you realize you're going to deal with some of the same stuff today? Racist police officers segregationists, people who don't like you trying to strive as a black person. Now, the question is, will you dare to strive anyway? Will you dare to strive anyway? Everybody put in the comments, so I dare to strive. I dare to strive. This is why I love reading about my ancestors, about people I never heard about, who they never talked about Black History Month. This is why I'm actually absolutely loving this book. I'm talking, I'm about, I'm reading about a black man in the late 1800s who dared to strive for success as a black person when most black folk wouldn't strive. And nothing has changed in a hundred years. There's only a few who will dare to strive while the rest simply won't strive. They'll just complain about what they can't get when they never tried to get it in the first place. Uh-oh, what did I just say? Let me say that again. They'd rather complain about what they don't have when they never tried to get it in the first place. Let's keep going. Woo! Many winters earlier, he had been pelted with rocks by racists for having the audacity as a black man, to be the only man in Memphis with a sled. What would they do when he opened a $100,000 or $2.9 million arena? What would they do? As a young man, he had dealt with white men with his fist and gun. Now, gray and wrinkled, he decided to exert a skill he had acquired with age, diplomacy. In 1900, a group of ex-Confederate soldiers decided to throw a reunion for Confederate veterans in Memphis. As they struggled to raise $80,000 to build a temporary auditorium in which to hold the affair, they received an unexpected donation of $1,000 or $29,000 from church, a former slave. I never gave a cent in my life so cheerfully or gladly as I gave that check to the Veterans Entertainment Fund, he said afterward. He had learned that goodwill could be bought when he had helped bail out Memphis from bankruptcy. He had learned, listen to this, that goodwill could be bought. Everybody put that in the comments below. Goodwill can be bought. Wow. He hoped that the $1,000 would be enough to protect his arena from the same resistance as his pool hall which a white mob had burned down when he was a young entrepreneur. Church Park, an auditorium opened a few weeks after the Confederate reunion. Without incident, the 1,200-seat auditorium had two levels, including a balcony. The stage was covered by a drop curtain that had a painting on the burning bulletin of the burning bulletin number two on it, which was the ship he had, he had rolled, it, right, rolled in on. Behind the curtain was a dark stained wooden stage with a bandstand. The auditorium sat on a four acre park ringed by flower gardens with carnival rides, an outdoor theater, gazebos, and orange trees. Peacocks roamed its grounds, spreading with colorful tales to the delight of visitors. He put on concerts with big bands. Eventually, he called his park a resort for colored people. Now, according to Gore Smith, as you're still here, <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about what we talk about here? I mean, a 1,200-seat auditorium with two levels, okay, a four-acre park. I don't know if we really can conceptualize what we're talking about here if we are not into real estate at all. Eventually, he called the park a resort for colored people. So in early 1900s, late 1800s, this black man built a resort for colored people in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm just saying, 
I'm just saying, if he could do this back in 1900, surely greater can we do in 2019. Would you agree? Let me say that again. If this black man could do this in the face of Confederates, in the face of racist police officers, in the face of, 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 of segregationists or whatever they called it, in 1900, surely black folk in 2019 can do greater works than he did in 1900. Since he had built the park without loans, without loans or partners, black newspapers began to refer to him as the wealthiest black man in America. Church and the park's African-American visitors were left alone. It seemed that church's 1,000 donation bought him and Memphis African-American population enough room to enjoy the paradise he had built for them. So his 1,000 donation to this, what you would think, like, why am I going to donate to something that's against me? He made a donation and he bought goodwill for what he was building for black folk. This is called strategy. Everybody put it on social strategy. And he also built this park and built this auditorium without a loan, without partners. Which tells me that my dream as a black man to build a business debt free is possible. Everybody put in comments, so it's possible. And if it was possible back in 1900, surely it's even more possible in 2019. This is why I continue to tell black folk, listen, y'all just not, y'all just not dreaming big enough. Y'all not thinking far enough. You keep thinking you got to go get money from other people versus raising it yourself and building loan or debt free. And even if you ain't got no help, you can still do what you got to do because we have an example of the most powerful black man alive who they consider to be the wealthiest black man in America back in 1900. And he did it without a loan. He did it without partners. And if he could do it, Surely, ERGJ in 2019, going into 2020, can do it. And not only can I do it, I can do it better than him because I got much more opportunity than he had back in 1900. Woo! See, we're going to rearrange some things this morning. This is why black folk do read. That's part one. <laughs> That's just part one. <laughs> Black Fortress. The story of the first six African Americans to escape slavery and become millionaires. Chapter 14, the most powerful Black man alive. Part two. Let's read. Mike the Gent, man, you got to get me suited and booted, brother. What's going on over Instagram? Man, what's going on Oh, YouTube? Say, hey, Peter Grant, my main man, say that. A lot of black people today don't have the discipline to save the money up to put towards something bigger than their dreams. Courtney Gore Smith said, man, this is powerful. Uh, Ava Adams said, man, more powerful resources and opportunities. Uh, Miss uh, Miss Vivian Reed said, man, it's possible to build a business debt free. And if a black man could build a park, if a black man could build an auditorium and he could do it without a loan, he can do it without partners. And he had the wherewithal to, to understand that the, uh, the, that the love of money is the root of all evil. So how did he get rid of the evil? He gave them some money because ultimately that's what evil wants. He, so he, imp he implemented strategy or what he called diplomacy. And he made available a space, a resort for colored people back in 1900, a safe space at this particular time. I'm not quite sure what we're going to keep reading, but at that time, it was a safe space for black folk to come and have their own resort. Woo! Let's get it. 
to segregationist Democrats and white nationalists in, my, in Memphis, Church's overture may have appeared to be political surrender. But in fact, it was the exactly the opposite. In 1900, shortly after the opening of his park, can somebody, thank you so much, Corey, diplomacy, can somebody get me the real, the, 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 the Webster's definition of diplomacy? I want to make sure we read that because this brother practiced diplomacy. I think we have an understanding of what that word means. But if someone can grab that for me out of Webster's or somewhere, if you can find it in the Urban Dictionary, that'd be great too. But either way, uh, let's get the, the definition of diplomacy. That's going to be our word of the day. In 1900, shortly after opening his park, Church became a delegate to the Republican National Convention. There he nominated Theodore Roosevelt for vice president and William McKinley for president. He donated $5,000 or in today's term, about $146,000 to the ticket making him one of the largest contri contri contributors to the campaign and winning him favor with the White House. Everybody put in the comments, so winning favor. So he made a contribution, right, to a, a candidate, and he won favor with the White House. Do you know how powerful this is? To, to, to exercise diplomacy and strategy to win favor? Not only can you buy goodwill, in this thing we call society, you can buy favor. Now, it might not be favor from God, but we ain't talking about that. We talking about favor with people, some of the same people who absolutely hate you. Okay, so diplomacy. Thank you so much, Mr. Gore Smith. The conduct by government officials of negotiation, other relations between nations, the art or science of conducting such negotiation. Here we go. Skill in managing negotiation. Skill in handling people. So there is little or no ill will. There is a skill in handling people. There's a skill in managing negotiations so there is no ill will or there is a win-win for everybody. Uh, Corey Bill found here said, learn to pronounce the noun professor activity or skill of managing international relations. The government should be assigned, boom, boom, boom. Talks, consultation, conference, dialogue, foreign affairs, foreign policy, the art of dealing, right? The art of dealing with people in a sensitive and effective way. This is the, the art of dealing with people in a sensitive and effective way. How many guys would agree that you and I could practice or could become more efficient in practicing diplomacy. The art of dealing with people in a sensitive and effective way. The skill in handling people. Wow. Woo, our word of the day, diplomacy. So he won him favor in the White House. Now, this is a black man in 1900 who was winning favor because he bought it with the White House, the most powerful house in the United States. Do we, do we really understand the, the magnitude and significance of what we're talking about? The most powerful black man alive? Woo! Church's younger self, an enslaved boy in the Mississippi Delta, might have found his current station in life incredible. He was now a millionaire, the richest black man in the country, with a line to the president. Church became acquainted with Booker T. Washington around 1900. Then Washington was starting an organization called the National Negro Business League, a black business network and think tank. Now, Booker T. Washington had the National Negro Business League Today, we have this thing called the Black Billionaires Club, a black business network and think tank. And ask yourself, are you a part of the Black Billionaires Club? If you are, go put in the console hashtag BBC. Right? So Booker T. Washington started something in 1900 called the National Negro League of Business. ERGJ started something in 2018 called the Black Billionaires Club, which is a black business network and think tank. And even if you're not part of the BBC, are you a part of any organization that's a black business network and 
think tank. Official Emperor said, man, the sapiens help you to develop those skills. Now, I don't know what the sapiens are, Miss Official Emperor, so you could enlighten me on what the hell uh, the sapiens are. I'm pretty sure they're important people, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> okay, so the sapiens, I don't know if, it's, if that's a sage. I don't know. I never heard that. I heard that term, but I don't know what that is. So that's a new vocabulary word to me as well. All right. And church was the first to join the National Negro Business League. Now, I don't know where this information was in Black History Month uh, when I was learning about all these black uh, important black folk, but I'm glad I'm getting it now. <laughs> OK. All right. Oh, it's a book. OK, thanks so much. It's a book. The Sapiens is a book. I'm gonna have to, can you inbox that to me? Because that seems like that's gonna be because I got a book called an Effective Way of Communicating, but sounds like that might be a better book for us to read. I'm not quite sure. Because we're gonna have to read a communication book. And we're gonna have to we're gonna have to actually learn how to implement diplomacy. We can't just say do it, because if we knew how to do it, we'd already be doing it. So now it's saying to me, we're gonna have to implement a, a workshop or a four-week thing where we're gonna have to learn how to uh, uh how to handle people. <laughs> that's not even I even there. You know that's not Irvin. That's from Winston Churchill. Diplomacy or tact is the act of telling people to go to hell in such a way that they look forward to the trip. <laughs> okay, the same business is a book. Money plus strategy equals power. Oh, I like that, bro. Core Bill. He said money plus strategy equals power. Money plus strategy equals power in this thing we call society okay beyond sharing an interest in black entrepreneurship church and washington didn't see eye to eye they vehemently disagreed on everything church sent his children to boarding school to college at oberlin and donated to black schools having been deprived of an education himself he resented washington's focus on manual labor instead of education and balance their differences aside their differences aside let me repeat that again their differences aside, the two became allies. And Church invited Washington to be one of the speakers at Church's auditorium. When McKinley was assassinated in 1901 and Roosevelt became president, Church was among the group that encouraged President Roosevelt to invite Booker T. Washington to the White House as an olive branch to Black America. At the death, after the death of his friend Frederick Douglass in 1895, Washington had assumed the mantle of the most prominent an influential black leader and activist in the country. On May 2nd of 1901, Roosevelt, heeding the calls from Washington supporters, invited him to dinner at the White House, invited him to dinner at the White House. For men like Church, who had been born into slavery and lived in the segregated South, the symbolism of seeing a black man dying in the White House with the president was awe-inspiring. Church later wrote the president and asked him to give an address to the colored people of Memphis in Church's auditorium. We're talking about a powerful black man, a millionaire in 1900, who was practicing diplomacy and exercising his influence to make a difference. And I want to go back up here because this is something I think you and I, as black folk, must come to grips with. It said that their differences aside, although they didn't see the eye to eye on everything, although church and Washington had different ideologies or philosophies or beliefs, they still became allies. Right now, beautiful people, I want you to think about that black brother or black sister in your life that you, for some reason, just can't seem to see eye to eye with. But you can still find a way, everybody putting God, so find a way to become allies if the mission itself aligns. Y'all want the same thing. Y'all just see a different way on how to get there. Y'all can still become allies. Now, what does that say to me? That says that, Corey Bill, you might do it this way. And I might do it this way. And that's okay, because Corey, you're going to grab that population of people that like to do it that way. And I'm going to grab this population of people that like to do it this way. And we can still become 
allies. See, Miss Courtney Gore Smith, you might operate in this particular way. And you're going to grab this population of brothers and sisters, and I'm going to grab it in my way, this population of brothers and sisters, and we can still become allies. Why? Because the mission is the same. See, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and we need everybody that can skin, okay? I need everybody. I mean, I can, I can skin my way, you can skin your way, but the cat still got to get skinned. So will you find a way? No matter the differences, as long as the mission or the end game is still the same, to become allies. That's part two. <laughs> Woo, that's part two. Oh, Lord. Woo. Black Fortress. The story of the first six African-Americans to become, to escape slavery and become millionaires. Chapter 14, the most powerful black man alive, part three. Let's read. The crowd in church's auditorium were was jubilant in 1902. Everybody put in console, 1902. When President Roosevelt took the stage and stared out at a sea of brown faces. So this brother got the president of the United States in 1902 to come to his built auditorium to speak to black folk. Do you hear what I'm saying? This brother got the president of the United States in 1902 to travel to Memphis, to his auditorium that he built to speak to black folk. I mean, my goodness. I mean, oh Lord, this a whole nother level of power and influence and money at this particular time. <laughs> hey, I'm interested. Lord, get Pastor Evan. That's his brother E, by the way. That's where brother E come out. Brother E, some, some water. Please don't put Pastor on my name. Okay. Church sat behind him in a pinstripe suit and a boiler hat, rocking back and forth in his chair and holding his cane in his hand. A brass band played Dixie, followed by the Star Spangled Banner. And then, after speeches from the mayor of Memphis and the governor of Louisiana, Roosevelt took the stage and gave a short speech. So he had the he had the mayor, he had the governor. And he had the president of the United States in his building. Afterward, he stood and waved to the crowd as the band played, it'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Though not a sensational, the president's address, though not as sensational, the president's address to an all black audience in a black owned auditorium in the South was in many ways as much of a milestone as Washington's dinner at the White House. Now, how in the world, I'm sorry, why in the world, I ain't never heard this before. Has anybody else ever heard this, that the president in 1902 was in a black owned auditorium with a, with a speech to an all black audience? I ain't heard that in political science. I never heard that in, uh, in, in Black History Month. I ain't never heard this story before. Am I just ignorant? Have I just been miseducated? Has anybody else ever heard this before? I'm just saying. This is my first time. I'm glad I'm reading the book now, but my goodness, where has this been? <laughs> okay. So Church was now a power broker politically. He was a power broker socially, and he was a power broker economically. Everybody put in console, power broker. Church continued his economic ascent buying buildings and bill until by 1906, he owned most of the district. That year he opened a bank and one of the buildings and named it the Solvent Savings Bank and Trust Company. So now he owned a bank. It was a two-story brick building painted white with a plate glass window. Church who had for years lent out rolls of cash from behind the bar and in the back rooms of his saloons was now officially in bank business as the first black owner of a bank in Memphis. 
He's deposited 25000 which in today's term would be about $671,000 of his own money. And the bank promised to pay 3% interest on deposits. We don't even get that much now, by the way. You go to a bank now, you go to Bank of America, put your money in there, you're going to get about, what, 0.15%. The most you're going to get nowadays is about 1.75, almost 2%, depending on the bank. You got to do your shopping, by the way. I teach that also. So back then, the bank promised to pay 3% interest on deposits. In 1907, the panic in 1907 started to run on the banks. The unfortunate timing could have ended churches could have ended churches uh let me i thought i had that on repeat on side they could have ended i'm sorry let me go back the unfortunate time it could have ended church's bank if all his depositors took out their money at once it would fail he staved off a run on the bank by exhibiting stacks of money in the plate glass window thus assuring his customers that he was solvent and it was safe to keep their money there in 1908, then a white, when a white bank tried to foreclose on a black, black Baptist church that Ida B. Wells had attended as a young woman, church and his bank swooped in and paid off the loan, saving it. Paid off the loan, saving it. Now, this is an example of the power of the black bank. Now, I'm not necessarily a big believer in black banks, by the way. I think they all kind of operate the same. But obviously, back in 1900, uh, because he owned the bank, he could make some bank, he could make some executive decisions, right? Which is why it's good to actually get uh, become, uh, have a relationship with the owner of the bank, if you can, that can make executive decisions on your behalf. So in 1908, he swooped in to save the Black Baptist Church that one of his, uh, he had he had admiration for Ida B. Wells back in that time. That is part three. We got one more part to go here as who we keep talking about, the most powerful Black man alive. Uh, O'Corbell said, I can get everyone 4% on the savings, bro. Okay, fantastic. That is what we're talking about. Got to find out what Court Bill is talking about there. Absolutely. Black Fortunes, the story of the first six African-Americans to escape slavery and become millionaires. Chapter 14, the, the most powerful black man alive, part four. Uh, banks pay interest on deposits. Yes, they do. Uh, if you have a savings account, you get paid interest on it. You just don't get paid a whole lot, depending on the bank. Uh, so that's where... Um, when you put your money into a bank, Mr. Grant, you become a lender instead of a borrower and you are lending your money to the bank for use. That is the whole reason why the bank exists to make money off of your money. And then they will lend you back your money for more money than they're paying you to use your money. That's the gig. In case you don't understand, that's why we must begin to understand. It's called financial literacy. I do teach financial education. I'm a certified financial educator. My boy, Corey Bill, can teach you everything you need to know about insurance. That's why we in this game, because we don't understand money and how it works in this thing called society. Okay? So, yes, when you put your money in a bank, you get paid interest. The gig is that they, 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 they loan you your own money to you at a higher interest then they're willing to pay to use your own money for their interest. Okay? <laughs> uh, Kiana, uh, Kanata Dada said, uh, I ain't never heard no black person do nothing this big for another black person for the love our people had for each other back then was so inspirational. Hey, don't say back then. It's not just back then, Kanata. We still have love for one another. The problem is this. We only pay attention to what they put on this thing called TV or the internet or their news. They own and control media. So we only watch what they show us. And just like they have whitewashed history, the same way they whitewash the media because it's called propaganda. And if we continue to turn it on and we continue to watch it, then we will begin to believe that we don't love each other. And that's simply not true. How do we know that? 
Well, we can see right here on this particular broadcast, we're using their media in a different way, and 10, 15 people are showing that we love each other. So let's not get it twisted by what we see that they show us on their controlled media. Okay, I think I addressed that. <laughs> Part four. <laughs> right? I, I can talk about that too, Peter Grant. I can show you where you get, uh, you shouldn't be paying for checking. I can show you that as well. <laughs> Several years later, okay? Several years later in 1910, everybody put a console in 1910. Robert Herburton Terrell, his son-in-law, was nominated to the Washington, D.C. Circuit Court. When he was confirmed, he became the first black judge in Washington. So now his son-in-law, right, his son-in-law became a, a judge, I guess a judge, yeah, a judge in Washington, D.C., the first black judge in Washington. It was yet another milestone for Church and his family. Risen from bondage, he had become a self-made man, a beloved son of Memphis, a connected political power broker, and the South's first black millionaire. Now, uh, Brother uh, Corey Bill, I believe you're in, you're either in Nashville or close to Memphis. I think you know enough about Memphis uh, that we could put together some type of BBC tour uh, meetup in Memphis, Tennessee, and we can see Bill Street or something around there. If you could help me out putting that together, I think that'd be absolutely phenomenal for us to take, make sure to do a, a BBC Memphis meetup in Memphis in 2020. i love for you to help me out with that, brother. Uh, Church was an old man by then. His hair was white and thinning, uh, and he leaned heavily on his cane to walk. As a young man, he had worked around the clock in his saloon, uh, keeping the lights on till the wee hours of the morning. In his last years, he did the same at his bank, working beside his son, Robert Reed Church Jr., the heir of his dynasty. The elder Robert Church spent his entire days in his office at the bank, writing loans and drumming up deposits. Without fail, as the sun set and people took to Bill Street for a night on the town to see W.C. Handy and others perform a new type of music called the blues. They see the light on in Bob's office. In the summer of 1912, Church began having heart trouble and was put on bed rest. Fearing the worst, his friends and family members flocked to Memphis to say goodbye. In his final hours, Booker T. Washington went in to see Church. He was the last person to see him alive. In August of 1912, Church died of a heart attack. He left behind a wife and five children and, a, and an estate worth over a million dollars. Mr. Robert Reed Church, here today on the New Black Wall Street Book Club, we put some respect on your name. And because of that respect, Mr. Robert Reed Church, rest in heaven, we're going to work on a meetup in your town, Memphis, Tennessee, so we can uh, hopefully see whatever may be left of your empire. Matter of fact, it's so phenomenal that we got a brother whose name is Corey, last name Bill, who's going to lead the Black Billionaires Club to Bill Street in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, my Lord. Man, what does 2020 have in store for us? And Lord willing, we're going to make it. In the comments below, I'd like for you to share something that you learned today. We don't do this just to do this, my beautiful people. We do this to make a difference. Uh, Robert Reed, R-E-E-D. Yep, R-E-E-D. We do this to make a difference. And hopefully today on the New Black Wall Street Book Club, We've made a difference in your life. My question to you today is basically simple. Was this worth your time and why? Why was this, this phenomenal time, reading about this phenomenal man, Mr. Robert Reed Church, the most powerful black man alive, who was a power broker socially, who was a power broker uh, economically, and was just a powerful black man politically. And if he could do it in 1900, if he could uh, mature 
and learn the power of diplomacy in order to advance his cause, advance his race, to do or to make history. Surely, you and I, in 2019 and beyond, not only can we do the same, but we can do greater. The good Lord says this. He says, man, greater things shall you do than I've done. And I believe we owe it to Mr. Robert Reed Church to ensure that we do that. Ms. Ava Dallas said, man, history book in Missouri said Mandela died uh, in prison. And we all know that's not true. But if you don't know any better, that's what you would believe until someone told you the truth. Knowledge is power. That's why we have to tell our own history. And I said, man, I learned the power of diplomacy. Miss Vivian Reese, I learned that he knew how to use diplomacy to obtain what he wanted. And Ms. Vivian Goodrich, I love the stories you read about Black Fortune. Very interesting. Absolutely. Again, our sponsor here today is uh, ERGJ Black Bazaar. Uh, you can check them out at ERGJBlackBazaar.com. I know I've talked fast and you type, so I'll give you an opportunity to type in what you learned today. Uh, and then go check out www.ERGJBlackBazaar.com. That's right, www.ERGJBlackBazaar.com. Shop black and support black as we are black. Uh, Big Sis Media, the other sponsor for today. And, of course, you can be a sponsor of the show as well. This is a daily show that we do. Uh, if you are interested in being a sponsor, want us to help you sell more stuff, want us to pump up the volume in your business, your organization, your movement, make sure you inbox us so we can discuss the terms for your sponsorship. Big Sis Media, the full service creative design agency uh, allow, that, that is here to watch over your most critical creative needs like a Big Sis would. Check them out at BigSisMediaGroup.com. That's right, BigSisMediaGroup.com. Ava Adams said, man, uh, Share our history to as many as will listen. We are a powerful race of people. Let's share our history. And it's a form. Is this a form of leveraging? Absolutely. You leverage. Yeah, absolutely. This is a form of leveraging. We got to learn that. We got to learn that. Well, my beautiful people, I want to say thanks so much for tuning in today's episode of the New Black Wall Street Book Club. And I want you to remember this, that it takes a village. It starts with us. Let's build as we climb. Together, we all we got, people. Matter of fact, we found out today we all we need, and thank God that's more than enough. Until next episode, you know what time it is, Mr. DJ. Hit the music. New, new, new black, new. It's the new Black Wall Street Book Club. New Black Wall Street. With your host, Evan Jefferson. Evan Jefferson. It's time for us to go. Yeah. Now, you ain't got to leave a computer. But we encourage you to get out there and learn and apply all the things you learn at the new Black Wall Street Book Club. Book Club. Yeah. The new Black Wall Street. The new Black Wall Street. Book club, book club.